Hi guys, it's Nick, the ASMR nerd, and welcome back to another episode of Relaxing Reviews. Today, I've got another mechanical keyboard review for you, and, oh, one second, sorry, what's that? They're, they're tired, they're sick of mechanical keyboard reviews? Is that even possible? Are you sure? Oh, okay, okay, all right, fair enough, okay. So, uh, I was just informed by my producer that uh, you guys want to see something other than just mechanical keyboards on relaxing reviews. Fair enough. Uh, it's been a little while since we've looked at anything other than a keyboard, as much as I do love the keyboards. Uh, but I have just the thing for you guys today. Today, we're going to take a look at a video projector, specifically the DB Power T20 video projector. This is a budget product, but it advertises a wide array of features, including uh, a bright lamp, high contrast ratio, uh, a, a long lifetime on the lamp, uh, low noise performance, uh, and uh, a wide array of input options, as well as a bunch of other stuff. But the most important thing about this projector is that it's 50 bucks, 50 US dollars. What does that even mean? How can you even build a video projector for 50 US dollars? What does it mean for build quality? What does it mean for image quality? Is it even useful? Is it even functional? These are the questions that I'm going to be addressing here today. Uh, of course, if you like what you see as we're going through the review, there is a purchase link to Amazon down in the video description that you can check out. But more than anything, I'm just, I'm just curious what a $50 projector looks like, what the use case for it is. I do suggest that you set your expectations accordingly. Uh, it is definitely a budget product but I'm very keen to put this thing through its paces and see what it can do. So without further ado, let's take a look at DB Power's T20 video projector. And here we have DB Power's T20 projector in box. As you can see, Packaging takes a very minimalist approach with the projector depicted on this matte black background in a sort of uh, shiny uh, embossing, I guess, or engraving. Yeah, it's a, it's a sort of an engraving, I guess. Uh, and it looks very sharp uh, and nice, but it's definitely prone to scuffs and fingerprints and scratches, so the surface gets marred quite easily. So you end up with the box looking kind of ratty, when in reality it's, it's not in bad shape. It just picks up wear very easily, so I don't know if this was the greatest choice of finish for their their box, but that's okay. It says on the front here, LED light source smart projector. And then a little bit of DB Power branding up there. Otherwise, the front of the box is uh, empty. There's nothing else there. Nothing at all on the bottom. A little bit around this side, some certifications and things. It has an Industry Canada stamp on it, so I guess this is 
packaging specific to the Canadian version of this product. And then, curiously, the back looks just like the front. There's literally nothing else to see here. Nothing new to see. The only product identification that we are given is over here in the form of a couple of stickers. We get a skew. And we get a barcode with a little bit of information that reads, let's see, DB Power T20 1500 lumens LCD mini projector. And then some numbers. So that's really all there is to see, except for the top, which has the flap, which we'll be opening in a moment. And this handy dandy handle. So, very Spartan packaging, which looks nice, but it has that issue where it just gets kind of scuffed looking, which is too bad. Okay, let us open this product up and see what we're dealing with here. So we're greeted with uh, white styrofoam packaging. It certainly does look well protected in there, doesn't it? Nothing else in the box. That's it. So everything is in this package here. Put the box aside. So this is what's inside and it just has a piece of styrofoam sitting on top. Okay, now we're talking. Inside we are greeted with a remote, which looks pretty nice. We'll take a closer look at it in a moment. manual, of course, with the DB Power branding on it. And then a bunch of inserts. A quick user guide. A DB Power Home Projector, only for projecting your wonderful life. I don't know what this offer for a free USB flash drive. If you write them a review. <laughs> hmm, okay. And a warranty card. Isn't that nice? Look at that. I love seeing an actual warranty card in with the product because so many products seem to lack it. This particular product is graced with a three-year warranty, which is pretty darn good. 
if I do say so myself. So, uh, I'm not really reading this here, but product received, satisfied, write a review, not satisfied. So, it's just a flow chart for whether you should contact them, basically, about your warranty. And another quick user guide. I don't know why we've got two. Oh, no, wait. Am I a fool? I'm a fool. This is the same one. I just didn't put it aside. Okay. So, what else in here? Oh, well, we've got a little quality check past certificate. Maybe. We have... Power cable, which looks like it's, oh, I don't know, three, four feet maybe. Not terribly long, but probably sufficient for most users. It's bound with a, just a plastic twist tie. The plug is protected by a little prong cover. also got an HDMI cable, which is a nice pack-in. HDMI cables are one of those things that really shouldn't be as expensive as they are, but, uh, and if you go buy off Amazon, you know, Amazon Basics or Monoprice or somewhere like that, you can get them for dollars, but, you know, just a few dollars. Um, but uh, if you go to somewhere like your Best Buy, you know, they charge you an arm and a leg. So, Anyway, it's nice to see one included. I've bought monitors, you know, displays before that don't have an HDMI cable included, uh, which seems like a really cheap thing, honestly. You know, so good to see. Anyway. And then it looks like we've got a little adapter here that, uh, what the heck is this? It splits out, what, stereo audio into something? or it receives some kind of multi-channel audio, I guess, and feeds it into stereo audio. I honestly don't know which way this thing goes. Oops. Uh, but it's probably explained in the uh, user manual there. Okay, let's take a look at the actual projector. say this thing is very well protected I feel like it's uh, it's very likely to survive shipping wherever it may be going oh I've got one other one other item in here it's the little threaded foot which I believe screws into the projector at the front and center on the bottom and you can use it to adjust the height of the projector so, we'll check that in a second, but I think that's what that is. Anyway, yes, uh, plenty adequate protection for shipping. Much better than other products I've seen. So, high marks there. is housed in this soft plastic bag. And here is the main event. As you can see, it's a white projector, white housing. 
I don't believe it is available in black. I think it's only available in white. I could be mistaken about that. But the product page on Amazon that depicts a white one at least. So, it's pretty small, as you can see. It's got decent heft to it. It's got a, on the top here, might as well just start working our way around. It's got a button cluster with a navigation wheel there, an OK button, power, uh, I don't know what S and M buttons do here, but uh, we'll figure that out. And a back button. A couple of LED indicator lights. DB power branding. And then up here, we've got warnings not to look into the projector lens. We've got the focus control knob right here and the keystone control knob, which controls the angle of the sides of the image, so that if you're projecting from a lower angle up at a wall, you can uh, make the image properly square on the wall, even when the projector itself is not square with the wall. Uh, or alternatively, if you're projecting from the ceiling down, you can do the same, I suspect. On the front, more DB power branding, an IR receiver, which is to work with that remote over here, and then the lens cap, which we can take off here, probably. So it just screws off. It's attached by a little elastic thread, and there is the big old lens itself, which appears to be very clean, free of dust or smudges and scratches. It looks quite pristine, so that's a good sign. We'll reattach that lens cover. Okay. move around this side. Not a lot here except some venting and a power input. Around the back is another IR receiver which is actually uh, pretty thoughtful because you might be operating it from in front or behind I guess. This one is labeled as such. It says IR on it whereas the one on the front does not. We've also got a VGA input. I don't know why you choose to use that. Uh, if you have HDMI, I guess it's just for legacy connections in case you're using an older laptop or PC and you've only got VGA out or a particularly cheap motherboard, I guess. And then this is where the business seems to take place around here. We've got the HDMI in. We've got a pair of USB ports. We've got an SD card slot, which is great to see. And then we've got audio. What have we got here? We've got audio in, I suspect, uh, in case you're using a connection that doesn't carry audio, like HDMI will carry audio, but, uh, and we've got a headphone jack. No, I guess what this is, the AV is not an input. It must be an output. It must be for plugging in speakers, I guess. Honestly, I'm not sure. Well, we'll look at the manual. We'll find out. This USB here, not sure what it's for, uh, but I guess you could plug in a USB stick, perhaps. Maybe there's some firmware on here that lets you navigate, you know, basic file system, play videos and things straight off a USB stick. There must be because it's got an SD card slot, right? So, and then here, uh, it looks like it's for charging 
USB devices because it says it's a uh, five volts out. So it's just a charging port, I guess. And then uh, another vent, and you can see big old heat sink inside there. Projectors do get pretty hot because they've got a high powered light inside them. DB Power claims that this projector is quite quiet. We will find out when we put it, put it through its paces. But uh, it does look like it's got a nice chunky heat sink in there, which bodes well for thermal management and audio levels. So, that's good. And then on the bottom, we've got four rubberized feet. One, two, three, four. We have what look like little sp speaker grills perhaps i'm honestly not certain if this thing has integrated speakers i think it may i think i may have read that in the product description although i can't imagine they're particularly good <laughs> or powerful uh, but nonetheless i think it does but we will check the manual about that uh we've also got just a little product ID sticker, which reads DB Power Mini Projector Model Number T20. Power voltage 100 to 240 volts. So it's got a wide voltage input. Uh, so you could use it in Europe quite comfortably, I guess. Uh, and then, as you can see, we have this threaded hole here, which is for this screw little leg that we found earlier. Let's just screw it all the way in. It's a good place for it to stay. There we go. I don't know why it's not there to begin with, actually, but anyway. Okay, so uh, the housing is this textured white plastic. Which feels and looks like it repels fingerprints pretty well. It feels relatively solid. Certainly I do like the styling, it's appealing. It's, uh, fairly minimalistic in its design, much as the outer packaging would suggest. And it feels pretty dense, like I said. It sounds hollow when you tap it on the top, but... But anywhere else feels much more solid. And like I said, you can see that big old heatsink in there, so you can tell where this weight's coming from. Okay, well, it looks good. The product itself looks and feels pretty solid. How it performs, we don't know yet, but uh, we'll test that out in a moment, in a few minutes. But first, let's look at just a couple of the other items that came along with. And we'll take a quick look at the remote. light. It is a textured plastic that's designed to look like a brushed aluminum or a brushed metal, but it's not. It's just plastic. Uh, looks like it takes a pair of AAA batteries, which are evidently not included. And I suppose that's fair because it's not strictly necessary. The remote is uh, somewhat redundant because all those controls exist on the projector itself, but nonetheless, it would have been nice to see a couple of batteries packed in. Anyway, I'll have to find a pair of AAAs.
basic buttons, power. That looks like an enter type button. A menu, directional, pad, OK button, back, volume up and down, and a mute button. So actually not all those functions are present on the projector itself, but uh, I suspect they're available through a, a menu, at least, on the projector. Um, I will say that these buttons are very satisfyingly tactile. They're not nearly as mushy as many remotes I've used, so that's actually kind of nice. Very clicky. But uh, otherwise, not a whole lot going on with the remote. It looks like it gets the job done, and it doesn't look offensive. It looks relatively handsome, even if it is very light and kind of cheap feeling. Okay, and uh, let's just take a quick look at the manual here. User guide. It says here the actual product may have some difference from the manual. The manual is just for reference. Okay. I should hope that the manual describes fairly well what the product is. A warm notice. Uh, yes, worth noting. Not recommended for PowerPoint, Word, Excel, or business presentations. Not quite sure why. Accessories list. AV signal cable, remote control, battery not included, as we've discovered, HDMI cable, which is included, very nice, a power cable, and a user, user manual. Safety notice, diagram with features and operation of the projector and the remote. User manual discussing basic operation. Oh, we've got some color in here. Keystone function, multimedia boost. Oh, here we go. Connections. Okay, so this is speakers out. So the one with the headphone thing is for speakers or, or headphones, I guess. This AV jack is for audio in, I guess? It's still actually not clear. It shows a, a DualShock 4 and a DVD player. I don't know. Uh, and everything else is pretty self-explanatory there. They show a, it looks like a tablet uh, for the, the secondary USB port there, which I must assume means it's for charging devices. So that's good. Supports a variety of formats for uh, video media and audio, MP3s, waves, AACs, the things you would expect for audio there. No flack, no lossless formats, pictures, it'll display JPEGs, bitmaps, or PNGs, videos, H2, H.264 uh, encoded video. No H.265 playback by the looks of it, but that's okay. I wouldn't really expect that. Anyway, this looks like it's fairly... Okay, so we've got a bunch of different languages in here. French, Spanish, the English guide is about 10 pages or something. But it does look like it covers most of the features anyway that you'd need to know about, so that is reasonable. That is about what I would expect. So the next step is going to be to hook this thing up and test it out with some different kinds of content. I'm going to do a bit of gaming. I'm going to 
uh, watch some video content. Uh, I will probably try it out for uh, like a PowerPoint just to see what it looks like, how it performs, uh, and some web browsing or something like that. The things I'm going to be looking for are display clarity, um, contrast, vibrance, brightness, these kinds of things, as well as noise levels from the fan and the cooling solution. Uh, once I get it set up, I'll film a little bit for you guys, and we'll we'll talk about some of those features, some of those uh, performance characteristics, as I check it out. Uh, and then after that, of course, we'll reconvene for the standard uh, pros and cons breakdown in the conclusion. But first, let's hook this thing up and check it out. So here we have the projector set up and displaying my desktop on my laptop and bear in mind that what you're seeing here is the projector as filmed by my camera as displayed through youtube on whatever screen you're watching so there are a number of steps in between what I'm seeing and what you are seeing. So it's not going to be a perfectly accurate rendition. I've tried to adjust my camera settings to be such that it looks as true on my camera screen as it looks to my eyes, but still it's not going to be perfect. So uh, bear that in mind uh, that everything that you're seeing on screen, take it with a grain of salt. I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> anyway, um, the setup was quite straightforward. Uh, it worked right out of the box. I will say that the included HDMI, HDMI cable <laughs> is really short. It's like two feet long, probably at best, which is adequate for plugging my laptop into my projector when it's sitting on this table. But it probably wouldn't be enough to plug in, uh, you know, a tower PC that's sitting on the floor into the projector or anything longer than that. Uh, and that dampens my enthusiasm slightly for this included cable. But anyway, uh, also bear in mind regarding the projection, this is projected against my wall right now. And my wall has a bit of a texture to it. It's kind of like uh, an eggshell finish, I think they call it. And so if you see a bit of graininess in the image, some of that comes from the low resolution of the projector, but some of it also comes from the texture of the paint on my wall. And so anyway, overall, this is an imperfect system, uh, what I'm attempting to do here, but that's just the best I can do here. And I will pick up the camera shortly and take it over to the screen or the projection so that you can see more closely what's going on over there. Uh, but there's a couple of things that I wanted to point out first that are more easily seen from a distance here. The first is that the overall impression of the image quality from a distance is pretty good, actually. The contrast is subjectively pretty high, uh, relatively pleasing to the eye. Uh, the black levels in particular are very good for a projector. Uh, my experience with projectors in the past has been that they often have very washed out black tones, and that is not the case here, at least not as currently configured. Also worth noting that what you are seeing right now is the standard normal settings for this projector. There is a menu system which we'll look at in just a moment. Um, and the, the defaults out of the box are actually not the normal or standard settings. The picture mode is automatically set to movie mode, I think, and the color mode is set to warm for some reason, but I've, I've set them all through the menus to just the standard normal settings as labeled in the menu systems. And what we'll do is we'll appraise the image quality as it is, and then I'll dig into those menus a bit and fool around with it and see if I can 
uh, improve the image quality a bit. It's not going to be a true calibration because I, I don't have a colorimeter or anything like that. It's just going to be by eye, but hopefully uh, we can improve it at least. As I was saying anyway, the subjective contrast looks pretty good. The advertised contrast on this projector is 1000 to 1, which is uh, typical of most LCD displays. Uh, and I would say just from looking at it, it looks about like that. Uh, contrast, however, is very sensitive to ambient light when it comes to projectors. And I would not recommend using this projector in a well-lit room or even a slightly lit room. Uh, even just the overhead light really washes out the blacks. And so this is clearly intended for dark viewing conditions. Uh, vibrance looks pretty good subjectively, if perhaps a bit jacked out, I guess, a bit blown out, um, as do the bright tones in the image, for that matter. I'll show you what I mean in a moment. Uh, and there is definitely some crushing going on in the blacks, as well as blowout going on in the whites. And there might be something we can do about that in the menus. We'll see. Uh, and it's a similar story for the colors, like they're very bright and vivid, which is satisfying to look at subjectively, but they are certainly not accurate, at least at the standard settings. But we will play around with those and see if we can get some more accurate color representation and uh, some better dynamic range. Or not dynamic range, I guess it's not going to change that. The black is black, the white is white, but uh, at least better uh, detail retention at the ends of the dynamic range. <laughs> so anyway, color accuracy, not excellent out of the box. And do, do you guys notice there's some significant vignetting going on around the edges of the screen? And what I mean by that is it's darker around the edges of the screen than in the middle of the screen. And it's a little hard to tell with the image I have on screen right now, but that should become much more obvious if I display a fully white screen. Uh, so why don't we bring some stuff up here? This here is a fantastic website for testing display accuracy and parameters, you know, contrast, color accuracy, those kinds of things, just general display rendering and quality. It's called Lagom, Lagom.nl. And if you just search Lagom, L-A-G-O-M LCD test, uh, it'll get you here. And it's fantastic for checking out new monitors, new displays. Uh, but let's see, uh, what, what we're looking at here is a uh, contrast test. And we'll come back to this in a moment, but let's just bring up uh, a fully white screen. Okay, so what I've actually done here is bring up just a, a white browser page in Chrome, and you can really see what I'm talking about here, about that vignetting. It's quite bright in the center. It's dimmer towards the corners. Vignetting of this sort is typical of inexpensive barrel lenses. That's my understanding anyway. I'm not any expert about optics uh, or anything like that, so you can feel free to correct me in the comments, but it's basically an artifact of the type of lens and the quality of the lens. And higher quality lenses would not exhibit such vignetting, but uh, bear in mind that this is of course a budget product, you know, priced appropriately, so I suppose this is a trade-off the manufacturer thought to be acceptable. So the vignetting definitely uh, visible. But uh, let's go back to the desktop here for a moment. And I'm going to pick up the camera and take you a little bit closer up to the image so we can talk about some of the, the detail and the challenges. Uh, oh, actually, one more thing. Before I do that, I'm going to show you a couple of the adjustments, the, the physical adjustments available on this projector. Uh, this projector has what they call a keystone, a vertical keystone adjustment, which allows us to compensate for 
the projector being above or below the point that it's projected to. Uh, and there is a, a dial uh, or a knob. I guess it's a dial, <laughs> whatever, just uh, on the projector itself. Uh, we can adjust it one way and the other, and it provides this vertical keystone adjustment correction. You can see what I mean when I say it adjusts the vertical geometry of the image. Uh, the projector and the camera are sitting still right now, and I'm just adjusting the keystone here. But you can see that when you adjust the keystone, it badly distorts the image. You can probably see on the bottom left and right, like all the icons get super blurry. And again, if I switch it the other way, the top of the screen gets really blurry. And so you really don't want to have to be adjusting the keystone too much if you don't have to. It's, it's much better to leave it more or less centered. And that seems to provide the best image quality, which is kind of unfortunate, but that just seems to be how it is. Also worth, worth noting that the adjustment dial ring for the keystone adjustment is a little bit rough feeling and kind of scratchy to adjust, not smooth. And so it makes it a little bit difficult to dial it in uh, how you want it. And the focus dial is just up ahead. And just for the sake of showing you here, we're going to take it way out of focus. Uh, and it too is actually a bit rough and scratchy in its motion, but it is a bit looser than the keystone adjustment, slightly easier to use. So that's going all the way one way. It looks like a, some kind of impressionist painting almost, doesn't it? Almost appealing. Uh, but if we keep focusing back through now, all the way, we're too far the other way. Let's back it off now, back to what looks pretty good, right about where the image is appealing, right about there, I would say. So, so far, so good, mostly from a distance, but now let's take the camera and go for a little walk closer up. Okay, I, I hope you're ready for a shaky cam adventure because that is what you are about to get, my friends. Uh, but what I wanna show you here is a couple of things. The first is the resolution situation. Uh, we are looking at that Lagom website that I mentioned earlier. And this projector is advertised in sort of loose terms as being uh, 1080p capable or 1080p ready, one of those terms. And what that actually means is that it can receive a 1080p signal at the most. That's its maximum input resolution. But its native resolution is much, much lower. And if we step in here, you will very clearly see... Oh, <laughs> blow away. I've got insects everywhere here. Little flies that are drawn to the light. Uh, apologies. But anyway, what you can see is the pixels so many obvious pixels. The native resolution of this projector is 800 by 480, which is kind of like this is 16 by nine version of like 800 by 600, which is a, a very, very low resolution. That is a relic of the 90s. You can see all the individual pixels and you can see that it is really hard to read text because of that low resolution. And I think this is why they do not recommend using this projector for like PowerPoint, uh, because it is really not suitable for rendering text. It really 800 by 480 is an abysmal resolution and it has no business existing in 2018. Uh, it, it's just terrible. <laughs> now, so that is quite disappointing. Now, in all fairness, uh, I did not really expect this projector to render in true 1080p, uh, because that is not a reasonable thing to expect at the price point. You uh, expect to pay a lot more for a native 1080p projector. But nonetheless, the native resolution still manages to disappoint. However, 
not all is lost, uh, because in some kinds of content, resolution doesn't matter so much. For instance, if you were watching a DVD movie or uh, 480p content on YouTube, you're not going to notice that resolution so much. So I'll put this through its paces shortly. Uh, I'll watch some video content and do some gaming to, to put it to the test. But the other thing that I wanted to show you while we're up close here, just step across, is, is this. Uh, these bars are showing steps of color from the darkest possible uh, luminosity, I guess, for the hue, uh, up to the brightest possible for the hue. I think that's what it's showing. <laughs> yeah, I believe that's what it is. Anyway, the point is that what we should be seeing here is steps of color all the way from the bottom up to the top, even steps of color. But what you actually see is not that. You can see individual steps of color up or down at the bottom, but very rapidly uh, it all becomes one continuous chunk of color. It's better in some hues than in others. And if I very quickly just try and grab the mouse with my left hand here and scroll, uh, you can see that the situation is is not quite as dire as it initially appears. It's better in some colors, but nonetheless, especially at the top here, gosh, there's a lot of bugs here. <laughs> uh, they're just making a cameo appearance. Uh, especially at the top here, you, you quickly run into trouble with color rendering. Uh, that means that these colors are getting clipped, essentially, in the brighter uh, hues. And so when I go in and do some color adjustments in the menu, this is the kind of thing I'm going to be trying to fix. Uh, and we'll take another look at this after I've made those color adjustments in the menu. Speaking of the menu, why don't we go take a quick look at the menu system. I'm going to place the camera back so that we can take a look at the whole screen and we'll look at the menu system. Okay, so here we are again. And I'm going to navigate the menu system with the remote, which I got some batteries for here. Okay, so that's pressing the menu button on the remote. Uh, and here we're presented with some picture options. There's picture mode. Uh, we have the option of standard, which I mentioned I set it to beforehand. There's a movie mode. You can see the color change a little bit. There's a, a dynamic mode, which I'm not quite sure what that does. And the manual doesn't explain any of this for what it's worth. Uh, it says the options are here, but it does not explain them. So I have no idea what dynamic does. But anyway, uh, then there's user. Uh, user mode, which will be our saving grace, I hope. Uh, it will let us dial in some better color accuracy, fix that contrast where it's blowing out the whites, adjust the brightness a little bit. Uh, and then anyway, back to the standard mode there. So uh, there's also projection mode, which changes the orientation of the image, pretty straightforward. Color temperature, allows us to do exactly what it says, which is control color temperature. We have some presets, including normal and warm. Uh, user, again, which lets us individually adjust the R, the G, and the B channels, which is fantastic. We will be making use of that shortly, probably. And then a cool option, which really actually looks kind of warmer than the normal. There's cool, there's normal cool, there's normal. I don't know about you, but cool looks warmer to me. <laughs> Warm certainly looks warmer, but anyway, whatever. And then we come back here, we have manual aspect ratio control, uh, which since we are receiving a 16 by 9 signal, that's why I have it set to 16 by 9, but if you wanted to crush it down to 4 by 3 for some reason, you, you could. There's also zoom modes. Uh, why you'd have those, really, I don't know. I don't know what just scan does, but there it is. Oh, uh, and we've got some others here. We can always do panorama. Oh, pardon my glass wire notification there. Uh, and we've also got point to point. And 
again, the manual does not explain any of these, so I don't really know what they do, but I'm just going to leave it on 16 by 9 because that's the correct aspect ratio for this resolution. But it's good to see that there are options, at least. And then there's something called noise reduction, which presumably applies some kind of processing method for reducing uh, like blocky noise in video content, like compression artifacts, because it, it seems to have no impact on, uh, on a static image here. So I assume it must be for video content, but I really, I do not know. And again, not explained in the manual. So I'm going to leave that off for now. If you press over, we have some sound options, like EQ options, which is kind of nice to see. However, <laughs> however, I will say that the integrated speakers are just as bad as you would think they would be. They are abysmal, and I would encourage you to use pretty much any other speakers other than the built-in speakers on this projector. Now, in fairness, that's not really what it's made for. Uh, and the built-ins will work in a pinch, but you really don't want to have to use them if you can possibly avoid it. And there are several different kinds of surround sound available, uh, including SRS True Sound XT. I'm not sure what kind of encoding that is and something just called surround. Um, and these are presumably for the output using that AV port, I guess. I guess. <laughs> uh, if we move over again, we've got a uh, clock, uh, on and off time, which I guess sets auto off timer, a sleep timer. Uh, I'm not sure how that differs from off time and on time. I guess it's just after a certain amount of time. And then we have the auto sleep option toggle down there. Okay. And then we have some basic options, including OSD language and uh, time, the input color range. This adjusts the dynamic range, so we can uh, change between full dynamic range and a reduced range. And that may actually fix some of that clipping and shadow detail crushing that we're seeing, but uh, I would rather do that with the other controls that are available while trying to preserve the full dynamic range. Uh, and apparently there's some kind of software update possible over USB, which is good, I guess. I suppose you download that from their website, I guess. Anyway, and that brings us back to our picture controls. There's one other thing. There's one more menu that's accessible here, and that is this one right here. There we go. Uh, this is... Um, a media selection uh, mode, or like a browser, I guess a media browser is what this is. So you can browse content on a, a USB stick that's plugged in or an SD card that you have inserted. You can also change the input source from here, although there's another dedicated button for doing that. Or we can go to the settings menu, which we just looked at. But this is where you would browse your movies, music, photos, whatever. Uh, I don't have anything plugged in right now, so I'm not testing that. But uh, uh, I trust that that works just dandy. And here's the interface for it. And we might as well quickly take a look at the source selection screen. So you can select USB input, AV input. Uh, which I guess uses that dongle that was included in the box. Um, PC, which would be that VGA input on the back of the projector. Uh, SD card, which is obviously a slot for. And HDMI, which is what I'm using right now out of my laptop. Okay, so I spent a bit of time uh, fiddling with the image settings. Not a whole lot of time, but enough. <laughs> to try and get what I think is a more accurate image. And I think I've managed to achieve it, but I did have to make some sacrifices to do so. I'm just gonna quickly bring up the menu to show you what my current settings are. 
um, hopefully, hopefully, it's visible to you through the camera, through your screen, and all these layers of abstraction, that this looks a little more natural than it did previously. So I'll show you first of all, well, no, actually, well, let's talk about the results first of all. <laughs> so this is th that screen of color gradients and contrast steps that I showed you before that goes from the darkest possible tone of a hue up to what is the brightest possible tone of that hue, the highest luminance uh, of, of the hue, if you want to get the proper terminology and the lowest luminance of the hue possible. And you can see after some adjustment that we've brought out a lot more detail in the brighter parts of the display. Not so much in the top here, it still suffers in this region, but uh, in many of the other hues, it looks a lot better than it did. And you can just make out the very darkest uh, luminances down here. Uh, again, to my eye, I can make those out. You may not be able to through my camera lens and your display, but at least to my eye, it's much better than it was. There's much more detail visible. Let's quickly look at black levels. So this is a series of squares, black and gray squares. And on a good quality display, you'll be able to see all of them. Um, currently to my eye, I can see most of them right down into this region. And what's weird is that actually up until a few moments ago, I could even see more of them. So there's some weird variability going on here. But anyway, at any rate, these are the, the darkest tones of black. Pure black is right over here. Uh, I can't see it on this projector, but every step above that, I can start to see a sort of a murky square. And as we move up and the tones get brighter, uh, higher luminance tones of black, uh, I can see more and more. And then we have pure white down on the right corner there. So at least now we have more detail in our darker tones, which will be represented in improved shadow detail. You do lose some uh, at the very bottom, what's called crushing some loss of detail in the very darkest parts of the image, but that may be impossible to rectify with this projector. And then let's also look at white saturation. So this is a similar situa situation <laughs> where we have checkerboards of squares. And uh, here we have a high contrast situation. And then down the bottom right, we have what is the contrast between pure white and one step just below that. And you can see that the way I have it configured right now, you can actually see the difference. There's a slight difference between pure white and the next step down. So that's pretty good. That means we are not losing any detail in our white highlights. There's no clipping currently uh, at that end of the spectrum or the, the, the range, the dynamic range. And so I think that's a much better result than what we had previously. And I think that's pretty evident in our test image where you can see a lot more detail in this part of the sky. You can see the clouds better. Uh, it's a much more detailed image, I think. So that's good. And one more thing that I wanted to look at here is banding. Uh, banding is... Um, an indication of how well your display, whether it's an LCD or projector or whatever, is able to render the differences between adjacent tones. And if you have a lot of banding, you'll have big jumps between adjacent tones. Uh, whereas if your display is rendering those tones properly, those transitions properly, you'll have a nice smooth gradient all the way from dark through to the light. And you can see, or hopefully you can see, I can see that there is significant banding going on uh, all the way through this gradient, as a matter of fact. Uh, and so instead of seeing a nice, smooth, even gradient, you're seeing vertical striping, essentially. There's little steps as you move 
uh, along the gradient, uh, steps in the way the projector renders these tones, which is not really something you want to see, but is evidently uh, an issue that this projector does have, even after I tweaked it and attempted to minimize that banding. So that's a consideration. Anyway, uh, if you're particularly dissensitive to that kind of thing. And banding tends to be most noticeable in dark scenes where you have something grading from like a black to a white, or like a black to a, a gray. Uh, a good example is the Skyrim main menu, where there's that smoke billowing across an otherwise black screen. If you have banding issues with your display, you will see uh, very noticeable steps at the margins of those billowing clouds. It won't look like a, a smooth gradient from gray into black. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I'm going to do a little bit of testing with a little bit of gaming here next uh, and watching a little bit of content on, on YouTube. Uh, and you guys can come along for a ride for a couple of minutes uh, so you can see this thing in action as well. And one of the things I might look at is that title screen in Skyrim, that main menu, uh, to see how the banding appears there. So let's look at some test content. Okay, so what I've got pulled up here is the Elder Scrolls 6 teaser trailer, which you are all probably quite familiar with, I imagine. So let's hit play and we'll see how it looks. So right away, you can see the banding issues in the fog, in the clouds, all over the place, actually. It's quite visible to me, uh, hopefully to you as well, through the camera. You can see there's definite vignetting, like we've already mentioned. Overall, the image is quite dark, which is probably a function of how I've set it. And I meant to show you the settings that I had to dial in to achieve what you're seeing here. But uh, let's, let's watch that one more time. Uh, there we go. Okay, so again, the banding issues are quite apparent. The motion handling seems all right. Like it looks fairly smooth and pleasing to me anyway. The overall image is not bad, but it is very dark the way I have it configured right now, so maybe it needs some more tweaking to get somewhere that's a little more balanced. Now before we go any farther, I want to show you what menu settings I've selected here. I started to do this a while back and I got sidetracked, so let's look at picture mode. So I have the contrast way down at 7. I had to bring it this far down in order to prevent the white clipping and the black crushing, but I do notice that the uh, black levels are, are quite dark subjectively as I have it currently configured like in that Elder Scrolls video. So perhaps we can bump up the brightness a bit to bring a bit of detail or life back into those dark areas. I also played around with this color slider here and it started at 50 and I brought it down to 30. Now, all of these, in fact, started at 50. Uh, I didn't touch the sharpness setting. It didn't seem to make a huge difference. Uh, the pixels are what the pixels are, ultimately. Uh, really, I think in this situation, what sharpness addresses is the space in between the pixels, which can uh, affect your subjective appear appearance of sharpness but it doesn't actually do anything to really enhance the definition of the picture. So anyway, these are the settings that I found worked for me. Um, brightness could maybe go up a little bit higher still to be able to see some of those black tones a little bit better. In fact, let's go to Ligom here. And so if we go back to the black levels page. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I don't know if you can see it, but I can close that there. You can see more of these black squares down at the bottom here. But uh, the sacrifice that had to be made, of course, 
uh, is in absolute black levels. The, the black levels now look more washed out to me than they did previously. So that is the sacrifice that you have to make <laughs> to improve the detail. And I think it's worth it to bring out the detail in both the upper and lower ends. Uh, and in fact, bumping up our brightness may have destroyed our... No, no, okay, we're good. There's still visible difference between the brightest luminance of white and one step down. So this is not a bad place to be, I think, in terms of the configuration. This is starting to look pretty decent. You could probably go up even further on the brightness, honestly, if you really wanted to. Uh, but, of course, every step you take up, you're going to be hurting your black levels. And I'm just comparing what I see here on the projector to what I see on my laptop's TN display. Uh, and uh, I think this is getting closer, much closer anyway. Not that my laptop's display is particularly exceptional, but it's certainly better uh, out of the box in terms of color accuracy. Uh, and in terms of, you know, uh, highlight and shadow detail and things like that, so. Okay. Oh, uh, and in terms of color temperature, I've just left it on the user mode uh, with everything set to 50 all the way through. RGB, all of 50. And that seems to have provided pretty reasonably accurate colors uh, with the other settings I have. Although whenever I talk about color accuracy, do take it with a grain of salt because... I am red-green colorblind, uh, but I do the best I can uh, to do what makes sense to me, and I have been trying to kind of match it against my laptop's display. So, uh, <laughs> quick aside, in case anyone's wondering, if you're sitting there curious, this is a photo that I took last summer on a mountain on Vancouver Island here called King's Peak. This was a hike uh, on the way to the summit, a beautiful little alpine meadow here, subalpine meadow, really, with a couple of creeks flowing through it uh, in the morning time, right around this time of year, last year, actually. Okay, now let's look at some gaming content. All right, and for the gaming test, I've got a game up that should look very familiar to most, if not all of you probably. That is, of course, Minecraft. Uh, this is probably a best case scenario for this projector because it's a lo-fi game where everything's pixelated anyway, so you're not really going to notice the low resolution of the projector. Uh, I just fired up a world here. This is uh, in 1.13 uh, so this is uh, vanilla Minecraft, unmodded. So the things I wanted to check are, is it usable for starts? And certainly I would say it is, um, but any game with a, a smaller interface might be difficult because you'd have trouble reading. Oh, what are these? What? Oh, they're turtles. <laughs> oh my gosh. I haven't played 1.13 yet. They're sea turtles, guys. It's good. They're adorable. Look at them. I need to play Minecraft again. We're working on getting a community Minecraft server up and running for everybody to play on. Uh, you can head to the Discord to learn more about that. It's definitely time to play some more Minecraft. But anyway, the thing I really wanted to check here was input lag, whether there's significant input lag. Now, it's kind of hard to know where the input lag is being introduced. Uh, where in the chain, but what I'm doing is I'm comparing the motion on my laptop screen to the projector, and there is noticeable input lag. So you wouldn't want to use this for like competitive gaming. Um, but uh, if I look at what's going on on the projector screen and ignore what's happening on my laptop screen, it's certainly playable. Uh, I can't quantify exactly what the input lag is. I don't have the instrumentation to do so, of course, but uh, it's it's perceptible, but not horrendous, is what I would say. But it's certainly perceptible. You could definitely use it for a budget gaming projector. Uh, what's this? 
There's more creatures out there. There's dolphins. That's so cool. I really need to play Minecraft again, you guys. Uh, it's especially suitable for like lo-fi games, like indie games with pixel art would look just fine on here. Probably retro games through an emulator or something like that. So if you've got a space where you can't fit a big TV, but you want a big image and you're playing lo-fi stuff, you could do worse than using this projector, putting a big image up on the wall, but I wouldn't want to use it for anything with fine detail or small text. Uh, but, or any kind of competitive multiplayer game, anything that requires highly, uh, very precise timing with your reactions. But something like Minecraft is just about perfect. Now, I mentioned I was going to play some Skyrim just to show you guys the title screen, uh, but I forgot that I do not have Skyrim installed on this laptop. I'm not going to install it right now. I'm not going to download it right now. But instead, you got to see the banding on the trailer, the Elder Scrolls 6 trailer, and I think that did it justice. All right, with all that done, let's head over to the conclusion where I will summarize the pros and cons of this projector. All right, now before we get to the summary of pros and cons, there's actually one more thing that I would like to show you guys or demonstrate for you, and that is the acoustic performance of the projector because that's an important part of the equation when it comes to uh, judging the usefulness of uh, one of these things. So I'm just going to press the on button, power button, and immediately you can hear the fan spinning up. Uh, it's projecting right now, but it's projecting nothing. It's not hooked up to anything. It's just the lamp is on. Uh, but move this from side to side so you can get it. feel for the volume levels um, it's not terrible it's not obtrusive uh, but it's not silent either and the fan does have a definite whine to it you can hear it listen and I think it's best for you to judge this for yourself in a situation where you can tell the microphones are situated uh, level with the camera so where your point of view is that's about what this thing would sound like from that distance so yeah is it awful no is it silent definitely not um, but it's it's serviceable at any rate uh, and I didn't find it too very distracting while I was doing my testing with it I should point out that uh, all that stuff that you just watched, uh, you didn't hear the fan whine there because I voiced it over. <laughs> so uh, through the magic of video making, I cut that out. Otherwise, it might have gotten annoying, especially in an ASMR video context. Uh, so uh, this is this is the true sound of this projector. I think it was important for you to hear. All right, let's uh, get to the conclusion. Alrighty, this is the part where I summarize the pros and the cons of the particular product in question. As always, let's start with the good stuff, the pros. The first thing that I really liked about the DB Power T20 was that it was very well packaged. It was nestled in a nice cradle of foam, and I have no doubt that it would survive whatever trials and tribulations it may experience during the shipping process. Second, I appreciate that there's a remote included. This is probably standard on most uh, projectors, but nonetheless, uh, on a product that is so cheap, it's great to see that they included the remote as well as the hardware buttons on the projector itself. Third thing I like is the diverse array of video input options. Uh, you've got your uh, VGA input, you've got your AV input, you've got your HDMI, and then you've also got the ability to read off of USB sticks or SD cards. So that's a pretty good, healthy number of ways to uh, display whatever kind of content you've got. Fourth thing is impressive black levels. They get nice and dark for a projector, and impressive peak brightness as well. Uh, there's certainly uh, 
uh, quite a, a lot of punch to the image out of the box, a lot of vividness to the colors, uh, a lot of contrast overall. And I don't doubt the 1000 to 1 contrast ratio claim that the manufacturer makes, uh, but you do have to sacrifice some of that if you want to actually recover some of the detail in the highlights and the shadows as we saw uh, with the testing that I did previously. Nonetheless, it does have admirably deep potential black levels and peak brightness. Last and perhaps most important positive thing to call out about this projector is the price point. 50 bucks US. It's awfully hard to argue with that. I didn't even know that you could get projectors for that cheap. So uh, when you frame the rest of this uh, projector in that context, uh, it suddenly becomes uh, a much more interesting proposition. All right, now let's talk about the cons, things that I didn't like so much. The first of these is that low native resolution. And this seems to be pretty par for the course for projectors in this price bracket. Again, 50 bucks. But 800 by 480 is still just, it's too low for most kinds of content, for most usage cases. Uh, and it is really very obvious, even when the image is pretty small and the projector is relatively close to whatever it's projecting onto, the pixels are still pretty obvious. The image is visibly grainy. So that's not so great. Another thing that I didn't actually explicitly point out in the review, but uh, that I have noticed through my usage uh, and testing of this projector is that it has uneven image clarity across the image. I found it very, very difficult to focus it in such a way that everything was sharp uh, or in focus. I'd play with the adjustment and I'd get the bottom of the image to look good, but the top would be out or vice versa, or I tilt the projector a little bit and one side would be out and the other wouldn't be. So with a fair amount of fiddling, I did get it to a point that was uh, acceptable, I guess, but it was never good. There was always some unevenness to the clarity across the image, which was somewhat disappointing. Another somewhat disappointing aspect of the image quality is the vignetting, which is very obvious. You saw it there when we looked at that pure white screen earlier. There's noticeable uh, reduction in brightness around the margins of the image. Uh, even when you're using it just to look at images or video, you can notice it. And while we're complaining about poor image quality, I might as well mention those banding issues. Those gradients are not rendered in a very satisfying way. They are very noticeable steps from luminance value to luminance value. And that's quite apparent in things like the Elder Scrolls 6 teaser trailer that we watched where the camera's flying through all those clouds and you can clearly see the banding artifacts that this projector produces. Last thing is that issue with the input lag. Uh, in the gaming test there where I was playing Minecraft, uh, I was explaining how there is perceptible input lag. It's not horrendous, but it's enough that I could definitely perceive it. And uh, I certainly wouldn't want to use this projector for any kind of high intensity gaming that requires precise reaction time. So for most uh, first person shooters, certainly any kind of competitive shooters, it's not really a viable option. So where does this leave us with DB Power's T20 projector? On one hand, the image quality, really not fantastic. On the other hand, it's really cheap. So sometimes you get what you pay for. What is the use case with this projector? Well, if you need to make something really big on a wall or a screen, uh, and you really don't care about image quality, and you don't have to read any small text or anything like that, and you're on a tight budget, then this projector might be for you. I have a feeling that it will probably disappoint many users, and I have a feeling that many users would be better off spending up a little bit, looking at the $100, $150 price range to find something that might perform a little bit better, especially from an image quality point of view. That said, 
I think that this projector does have its applications, maybe for uh, like family use, if you want to project kids' movies on a wall for, uh, for your children or something like that, where they're not going to be picky about image quality, you just need a big, vibrant image, uh, then this projector would work absolutely for 50 bucks. Great option. Uh, or if you want to have something that's portable that you can, you know, take over to a friend's place uh, to project up on the wall to play some retro games, maybe on an emulator or just something uh, lo-fi and not particularly demanding, then I think this could do the trick as well. So uh, while I wouldn't recommend it for the majority of users because of the image quality issues discussed, at the $50 price point, I do think it has its applications in certain use cases where image quality is not so much of a concern. And that, my friends, brings us to the end of another relaxing review. If you liked what you saw here today, you'd like to check out DB Power's T20 projector, there is, of course, a link down in the video description. You can check it out there. Special thanks to DB Power for sending over the review unit that we looked at here today. I hope you all found this video informative. I hope you found it relaxing. And I look very forward to having you back here next time for another episode of Relaxing Reviews. And maybe some more keyboards in future. I'll never give up on the keyboards. There's always more keyboards to come. <laughs> Alright. Bye for now, guys.